So first of all, before we get there, who was who was Jeroboam? Well, let, let's pray. Let's pray first. Ask the Lord's blessing. Okay, let's pray. Father, we pray now that as we turn to your holy word, uh, Lord, that you would bless us. We thank you, Lord, that your word is uh, powerful and profitable. Uh, it is good for us to know uh, the word, both the Old and the New Testament. Uh, we thank you, Lord, uh, that uh, uh, you uh, delight over your people when we turn our eyes upon you. Uh, we thank you that you uh, show us who you are, re revealing your, uh, yourself to us uh, through your word. And so we pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so who, who was Jeroboam? Who was Jeroboam? Anybody want to tell me before we get there? Asher, you know who Jeroboam was? was someone that, that did things that God did not command. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. He did things that God did not command. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Anybody want to get more specific? He was the king of Israel. Yeah, okay, so he was the king of northern Israel. And uh, how did he get to be the king of northern Israel? Right now? Who was he before he was king? Anybody remember? Before he was the king? Son of Solomon. Well, he, so that's real close. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon, and Jeroboam was Solomon's uh, military, one of Solomon's military officers. Uh, I always thought it was weird that their names were so similar, you know? Yes, so Rehoboam, Rehoboam was the rightful heir to the, the uh, to the throne. So you got David, then Solomon, then Rehoboam. Uh, so what happened? What, what, what was the cause of the split? Solomon's uh, turning from God. And, and it's interesting that like Solomon wasn't punished, but his family was punished, his son after him. But because God loved David so much, he says, I'm not going to punish you like perhaps I should, but I will get you some. Yeah, that was a summary, yes. So, but the immediate cause was Rehoboam did something. Anybody remember what he, what he did? Golden calves. No, no, that's Jeroboam. We're going to get to that. That's good, yeah. Um, so, okay, so so just cut to, so to, cut, cut to, to the chase here. I understand one thing. You can't get your bones mixed up. You can't get your bones mixed up. That's right. Yeah, I know one thing. Uh, I'm a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior, right? All right. So, uh, so okay, so in all seriousness, so you've got Rehoboam, Solomon's son. When he takes the throne, when he takes the throne, uh, the the advisors, the old, the old men, the advisors, they say to him, listen, you know, your, your father Solomon, we've just been through this big temple building project, and uh, the people are tired, and, and so be easy on them, you know, give them, give them some rest and reprieve, and does anybody remember what Rehoboam's response is? He's going to sock it to him. Yeah, he, said, he says, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist, okay, <laughs> meaning I'm going to lay it heavy on him. Uh, you know, and uh, they better not mess with me. So, so, so Rehoboam's biggest fault was he did not listen to the elders. He did not listen to the voice of those that went before him. He was a young man, uh, and he said, "I'm going to rule with an iron fist." So Jeroboam led the led the hearts of ten of the tribes away uh, from from Rehoboam, and that's where you end up with the northern uh, kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Now. Um, now he also did. So Jeroboam also did something else. So, so if, if this is uh, if this is Israel in the north and Judah in the south, and this is not an actual scale map. I'm not going through all of that. But let's just say that, that Jerusalem is here. Jerusalem is the place where God commanded at, that, at this point for them to worship, right? And uh, and he, he prophesied this all the way, and commanded this all the way back in the Pentateuch in Deuteronomy. He said, when I bring you into the land and give you rest, you will worship in the place where I set my name. And, uh, and that, that ended up being Jerusalem. And they were commanded to go to Jerusalem. And, and so the temple was in Jerusalem, the sacrificial system, the priesthood was in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, you know, everything was centered around Jerusalem, which makes it very uh, 
a dramatic statement when Jesus says in John 4, you will no longer worship in Jerusalem or on this mountain. The mountain was speaking of Mount Gerizim. This became Samaria. So to back up, in 722 B.C., in 722 B.C., the Assyrians conquered northern Israel and intermarried Israel with Assyrians, with other peoples that were captured by the Assyrians. The religions were blended, and they turned into the mixture of Samaritanism. And they worshiped on Mount Gerizim. There was an altar on Mount Gerizim. Gerizim was one of the two mountains where, when the people first went into the land, they had the national inauguration ceremony. Gerizim was the mountain of blessing. Ebal was the mountain of cursing. And so Jesus says, the time is coming when you'll no longer worship at Jerusalem or on this mountain, but the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth, showing that we can now draw near to the Father anywhere. We don't have to journey to Jerusalem. The holy ground is wherever God's people are gathered. So that's a big deal. But at this point in time, according to God's command, they had to go to Jerusalem. So what does Jeroboam do? Now, he's got a problem. He's got ten tribes up here, but a lot of them are believers, or they at least are familiar with the law of God. So what does he do? Anybody know? Yeah, Asher, do you know? He said worship on the side of the kingdom. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, he built two altars at Dan and Bethel. Now, Bethel was only five miles away from Jerusalem, but it was over the northern border. And he said, you don't need to go down to Jerusalem to worship. You can worship here or here. And he built something at these two spots. Does anybody remember what he built? What kind of idol he built? Yeah, he built golden calves at Dan and Bethel. So that was one of the three sins of Jeroboam. So let's start reading in 1 Kings 12. We probably won't get through all this tonight, but we'll have a good refresher course here. So let's start in 1 Kings 12, 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices to the Lord uh, in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of the people will turn again to their Lord, to Re Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So notice he, he, he knows that Rehoboam is their Lord. He is their king. So the king took counsel. and So he at least took counsel where Rehoboam didn't. The king took counsel, bad counsel, and made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, who, who said that originally? Aaron. 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 Yeah, so, that's right. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Then this thing became a sin, for the people went as far as Dan before one. He also made the temples on high places. On the high places and appointed priests from among all the people who were not of the Levites. So that was sin number two. So sin number one is he, he, he built the golden calves and he re rebelled against the, the kingdom. Sin number two was he appointed priests from among all the people who were not of the Levites. So this was, a, this was an illegitimate priesthood. Um, and this gets at the doctrine of right ordination. It gets at the fact that, you know... Uh, you know, uh, not anybody could be a priest back then. You, you had to be uh, a Levite. And it didn't matter if you had a real call, you felt like you had a call from God, or you really, really wanted to, you had to be a Levite. And so Jeroboam uh, rejects that. And Jeroboam appointed a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah, and he offered sacrifices on the altar. So those are other sins. He appointed a feast day, out of his own heart, we'll see that in just a second. Uh, and he offered sacrifices. Now he's a, he's not he's not a king, but even if he was, he's not a legitimate king, but even if he was a legitimate a legitimate king, kings are not to be offering sacrifices. The priests are. 
So he's doing whatever he wants to do. So he did in Bethel sacrificing to the calves that he made. So now he's sacrificing to the calves. And he placed in Bethel the priest of the high places that he had made. So you can hear this repetition. He, he, he. He did this. He went up to the altar that he had made in Bethel on the 15th day in the 8th month. In the month that he had devised from his own heart. And he instituted a feast for the people of Israel and went up to the altar to make offerings. So here is the, the – this portion of scripture collectively is referred to throughout the books of the kings as the sins of Jeroboam. These are the sins of Jeroboam. Uh, he built golden calves. He uh, made the people sin uh, by worshiping them. He appointed priests that were not legitimate priests against the, the word of God. He, he had the audacity to appoint a feast day um, that was not commanded in the word of God. Uh, and he sacrificed at an altar that he had made. Okay, so what's God's response to this? Starting in chapter 13. And behold, a man of God, we don't know who he is, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. So, so notice there's competition now between uh, Jerusalem and the legitimate priesthood in Israel. There's been a church split, if you will, and there's competition. Who can put on the best show? Who can attract the most people? Who can keep, who can keep the people from uh, going to one or the other? God prevented all this, uh, would have prevented all this if they just followed his word. And the man cried, and the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priest of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the, and when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, from the altar saying, Seize him! And his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up, so that he could not draw it back to himself. So here's the king, in his own power, in his own might, and he's stretching out saying, seize him, and then it's stuck, and he can't draw it back. The altar also was torn down, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king said to the man of God, entreat now the favor of the Lord your God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. And the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him and became as it was before. And the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. So Jeroboam says, Now let's be friends. Right. And the man of God said to the king, If you give me half your house, I will not go with you, and I will not eat bread or drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. Okay, we're going to stop there uh, for some comments uh, and some, some exposition. Um, so, uh, first of all, what do y'all think about this? Any, any thoughts so far about what we've read? It, like you say, uh, you talk about like a, a church split. I mean, you know, one of the things that he had said, uh, I think, was that, you know, don't, don't go to Jerusalem to worship. And it's like, I've heard people say, you know, don't, don't go to, you know, don't necessarily go to the church that's most convenient. Go to the one that's most biblical. Yes. But that has, you know, a certain ring to it when you think about the fact that um, it would have been convenient for the people to not have to travel all the way to Jerusalem, who were there, and the position of authority, Jeroboam, was actually sanctioning the disobedience of the whole community. And to the extent that his word meant anything to people in that regard, you know, he was re he was specifically responsible for their sin. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were too, but still, yeah, he was leading them astray. 
And his authority itself was illegitimate. He was a self-appointed king. He got self-appointed priest. Uh, he got a lot of what, what the reformers would call will, will worship. You know, we want to do this, so we're going to do it. What are we going to say? Well, this question is, is to, to, we've got a prophet that's disobedient. A prophet that, uh, that's disobedient. That's what he said. The prophet's disobedient. Where are you? Where are you? Eleven. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to get to him. We're not there yet. We're going to get to okay. him. <laughs> We, we're just through verse 10 right now, but uh, but yeah, you've got a you got a disobedient. We're going to get to him. That's he's a big. This, that's a big uh, a big point for a few minutes from now, but <laughs> hopefully or next week. But anyway, uh, so uh, anybody else, Jill? Do you have a? Well, I was thinking um, we did talk about how he, he appointed men from all the tribes except the Levites to be priests. But I see that as God's providence that his appointed priests were not involved in worship of anything other than the true God. Mm -hmm. Because those are the priests he chose and appointed to be in charge of the worship of God. Yes. And so it's, it's almost like um, he maybe not saved them, but uh, through his you know, ultimately he kept them from having to exercise their gifts given by him to worship the calves, golden calves instead of the true Lord. Yeah, and we've seen, you know, yeah, and, and so, you know, a um, couple of things, you know, the people should have been very it should have been very obvious, you know, to them to be able to recognize that this worship's illegitimate. You know, there's not there's a golden calf, obviously that's wrong. The Levite, you know, it's not a Levite that's a priest. Uh, so, you know, uh, you're going to offer sacrifices to God. Are you a Levite? Well, no. You know, well, God won't accept sacrifices from your hand. They had, they had every evidence necessary if they wanted to follow God to recognize what was true and what was false. So, um, and, uh, you know, and the same is true today. I mean, you, you can tell. Uh, there, there are, <laughs> in our committee meeting yesterday, and I can't go into, into a lot of detail, but, uh, you know, examining young men that are going into the ministry, uh, we, uh, we met with a man that was, that was uh, coming out of the PCUSA, the liberal uh, Presbyterian church, and, uh, which we, we believe is completely apostate. And, uh, and uh, the, the uh, you know, he, he was going to Union Seminary and was talking about how, you know, they, they confess their sins to houseplants. They, they, they literally confess their sins to houseplants. Uh, and they, uh, you know, all of his uh, textbooks were on liberation theology. And I won't, I won't fill in any more details. But uh, he, said, he said out of his entire class, he was one of only three people that believed that Jesus Christ was the only way to God. So only three people at this seminary, uh, the seminary's graduating class, uh, believe that uh, that Christ in the exclusivity of Christ. So and Jesus is very clear about this. The Bible is very clear about this. So anybody, so so these lines of demarcation make it very easy to recognize who is being faithful to God and who's being unfaithful. But if you want entertainment, you want big shows, you want uh, you know nobody does it better than the PCUSA. If you if you want the entertainment. Uh, you should look at one of their general assemblies. They've got all kinds of banners. They dress up like animals. They walk down the aisle. You know, they, they do these huge, fantastic shows to entertain the people. But the but the heart of God's people, uh, God's God's uh, the godly heart. We want the word. Jesus says, "My sheep hear my voice." Right. And so all the pomp and circumstance of golden calves and all this stuff it doesn't matter to to, to the true believer. We want the milk and meat of God's word. And it doesn't, so anyway. Uh, so, so the same sorts of demarcations are still around today. Uh, if, you, if you think about it, uh, you can clearly see where the true worship is supposed to be, who's supposed to be administering it, um, and, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, yeah, buddy, one, one comment, and then, yeah. What's up? Was Jared going to say being on his first or second sin? You don't have to worship in churches. That's enough. That's enough. Okay. Yeah. He. Yeah. He was saying that you don't have to worship at Jerusalem. He said it's too hard for you. It's too hard for you to go to Jerusalem. You can worship. You can worship here. 
Um, and, and this is, you know, this is what people do, though. They, they say, you know, surely God will, you know, if we all get together, if we all get together and decide on a different way, then surely God will be okay with it. Right? I mean, he's not going to say no to all of us, is he? But what does Psalm 2 say? It says, it says that, the, the, that the nations rage, the peoples join together, and they say, let us burst the bonds. Let's burst his bonds from us. You know, let's be free from him and do what we want to do. Um, so, okay. All right. So, uh, notice a couple things. So, didn't your mom just tell you to stop that? She said to be quiet. Okay. She keeps telling you to stop that. Okay. I've, I've heard her at least four times so far. Okay. All right. So, uh, so first of all, it, so God sends a man of God in verse thir- in chapter in verse one uh, to come out of Judah and to rebuke Jeroboam, and to do so right when he's standing at the altar uh, offering sacrifices. And so he's doing this publicly. Now, notice notice this. He's doing this publicly. Public sin deserves public rebuke. Public sin deserves public rebuke. One of the biggest falsehoods that is uh, that goes around today is that public sin deserves private rebuke. It's between me and God. And, yeah, well, and not just that, but like, like somebody does something publicly. Somebody teaches false doctrine. And, uh, you know, and... and uh, and they're called out on it publicly. They're publicly teaching that which is false, and someone publicly calls them out on it, you know, whether it's online or whatever. The, the answer is, the, the, the response is always, that's unloving. You should have come to me privately, even if they're publicly teaching it. Um, what does Paul do to, to Peter when Peter is, is defying uh, the, the gospel? He's in Galatians chapter 2. Uh, he's, he's refusing to eat with Gentiles. Um, he's acting like he's better than the Gentiles. He's denying the gospel. Paul says, I will stood him to his face. Uh, the scriptures say, yeah, yeah, it, it, you know, those who, con- who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all, speaking to the, to the uh, pastors and elders. If you take your coat off one more time, I'm going to stop the lesson and I'm going to take you out of here. You put taking it off and putting it on. Your mom's told you to stop. I've told you to stop. You hear me? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Now, uh, so so there is a there's a public rebuke uh, that's issued to Jeroboam. It's got to be very embarrassing to him because he's he's exalted himself as king. His whole deal that he's created uh, rests on people trusting his authority and not God's authority. And now he's being rebuked by this guy. So his response is kill him, right? Uh, and. Uh, Notice that, that also uh, when, when the prophet prophesies, he prophesies Josiah by name. Uh, he says in verse 2, he says, uh, he says that, uh, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you on the altar, priest of the high places. Now here's, this is a far-reaching prophecy. There's a couple things to note here. Uh, number one, he prophesies the person who's going to destroy uh, the altar by name, Josiah. Does anybody know how long it was, roughly, before Josiah was even born? It's close to 300 years. So it's 290. This, the fulfillment of this prophecy happened 290 years later. Yes, Ellen. I saw it in the Well, uh, and, and that's a good point. But the the altar is is rebuilt. Uh, and, uh, and and Jeroboam continues to offer sacrifices on it, uh, and so do his descendants. Um, and you you can see this uh, in the last couple of verses of, of, of the chapter. He he continues. He does not turn from his evil ways. Uh, and you can read about this. Uh, you can read about the fulfillment of this. Uh, I think it's in it's in Second Kings. I can't remember which chapter. But anyway. So Josiah's prophesied by name. Notice he comes out of Judah, which is the which is out, out of the house of David, and that's significant because the house of David is the house from which uh, Jeroboam rebelled. Right? Jeroboam was a servant in the house of David. He was a military leader, and now he's exalted himself against the house of David. And this prophet is prophesying and saying that the judgment on this thing that you're building 
is going to be – is going to come from the house of David, from a descendant of David. So he's showing that in spite of Jeroboam's rebellion, the house of David is going to continue. It's going to thrive, and Josiah is going to be used to judge this abomination. And then he says that the priest – the bones of the priest will be burned on the altar. The priest will be sacrificed on the altar, and the human bones will be burned on it. Now, there's nothing that defiles an altar more than something like that. Okay, and then he gives a sign of confirmation in verse 3. This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. Okay, now here's something else. In verses 4 and 5, we see that God divinely protects his prophet. He's insulted the king face to face. What a bold man. Can you imagine? Can you imagine just walking up in the middle of – you know, I've got a friend. I've mentioned him before. I met with him yesterday, and he went into a church that was, shall we say, very liberal. He was asked to preach at this church that was very liberal, and he preached against the sin that was celebrated in his church. And he did it very – shall we say unlawful marriages were being celebrated in the church and being promoted by this church. And he did it very, very lovingly. He said if you're engaged in this sin, God can deliver you from it. But you must repent and look to Christ. And they spit on him, and they poked at him. And when he walked out to the parking lot, they turned all the lights off on him so that he couldn't – so that he was in the dark. He was afraid. He was afraid they were going to attack him. But I thought, you know what? Boldness to stand and directly confront the sin because that's the only hope that somebody has. If they're in sin is to – if you affirm the sin, if you say it's okay, God will understand. God will be okay with it, and his word says no, you'll perish. And you don't warn them, then they've got no hope. And so this man was doing a very loving thing. I know the guy. I know he wasn't mean. He wasn't hateful. He was pleading with them to turn from it. That's still bold. Now this young prophet here, this prophet, he goes right into northern Israel, and he walks right up to the king and rebukes him in the presence of everybody. That's bold. That's really bold. And the king, Jeroboam, stretches out his hand and says, seize him, and God freezes the king's hand in place so he can't draw it back. And this is a sign. You know, when you offer sacrifice on the altar in the Old Testament, sometimes God would act, right? You know, he would – if you think about Aaron when the sacrifice was first instituted, God said do it this way. And when in Numbers chapter 9 when God – when the sacrifice is offered, you know, fire consumes the sacrifice. Of course, in the next chapter, Nadab and Abihu do it the wrong way, and fire consumes them. So God acts, right? And so this is a – this is sort of an inaugural offering here that Jeroboam is making, or it's at least very close to the time that he's instituted this thing. And God acts, but God acts by judging him and by freezing his hand in place, and that's got to be very embarrassing to the king. And God is showing that he is not obligated to receive false worship. He's not. And the same is true today. That's why we believe in the regular principle. We believe that it matters how we worship God. God has the right to decide how God is to be worshipped. So we don't make things up. We don't do things – we don't worship him in ways that he hasn't appointed in his word. We're content, and we're really actually very excited to worship God, to be able to worship God, to be able to draw near to the maker of heaven and earth. What a privilege. And so why would we – why would we be unsatisfied with what he's given us? So now the king is publicly humiliated, and he has to ask the prophet – and this is a repeated theme in the Old Testament. When you rebel against the prophet, the prophet has to pray for you. So think about Miriam when she leads the rebellion against Moses. God has mercy on her, but he says, Moses is going to have to pray for you. And that's to dignify the one that God has established. 
today the person that he dignifies is Christ. You can't draw near to God apart from Christ. No one comes to the Father but through the Son. So, okay. And so this also shows that Jeroboam can't pray for himself. Notice he says, pray for me. That reminds us of Simon the magician in Acts chapter 8. He says, pray for me. He asked Peter to pray for him after he's been rebuked because he thought he could buy the Holy Spirit with money. Okay, and now the king has been prayed for by the prophet, and the Lord restores his hand. And then the king says, come home with me. Come home with me. And so now he wants to get in good with this prophet. And the prophet won't do it. Why won't the prophet do it? Anybody know? Because the king is an unbeliever, and he's going to an unclean mansion. Well, yeah, I mean, but that's not the reason in the text. So, but, I mean, you're God told him not to. God told him not to. You remember Forrest Gump? Who's never seen Forrest Gump? Raise your hand. Okay. When he says, you know, Gump, why did you put your weapon together so quickly, Gump? Remember that? Because you told me to, drill sergeant. That's that's a good answer. I mean, you know, the answer is God said not to. It doesn't matter if the king says, "Yeah, come to my house." God said not to. Uh, you know, and that's just that's that's enough for the prophet. The you know. If you give me half my house, half your house, the man of God says to the king, I will not go in with you. I will not eat bread or drink water in this place. For so was it commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. Listen, if if our culture, if our Christian culture would just get a hold of this principle, things would change real quick. Real quick. We don't have the right to do what God has, has condemned, period. It doesn't matter whether we like it, whether we think it's great, whether it's pleasant, whether it's a... It doesn't matter. So this man is obeying. Uh, he, he just he obeys the Lord. And he shows the king... Now this is the nicest thing he can actually do to the king. Because what he's saying to the king is, I'm not going to rebel against God. It doesn't matter what you give me. And what the king ought to go away and think is... Okay, this man's been blessed by God. God has dignified him, and he's walking in. He's content to not take my riches, not take my favor, but just to be content with the Lord. But look at what I've done. I, I have, I have exchanged the communion with God and the truth with God for all this that my hand has built. He's like Nebuchadnezzar, you know. He's built all this. He's doing all this. Um, so it's a convicting word. It would have been cruel for the man. Not only would it have been rebelling against God and breaking the first great commandment, but it would have been breaking the second great commandment. It would not have been good for Jeroboam for this man to go in with him and soften the blow. Yes, sir? Reminds me of uh, Genesis 14 with Abraham uh, right after the battle uh, that he has. And he gives a tenth of everything that he has to Melchizedek. Yes. The next verse is he and the king of Sodom talking. And... um, the king of Sodom uh, offers him mm. the, the good. He says, Give the people and to me and take the goods for yourself. Abraham says, I'm not going to take anything from you. Yes. Um, it seems like a similar principle in that case. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. That I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you you should say I have made Abram rich. Yeah, and he so he's doing he's doing uh, he's fulfilling the two both great commandments there too, uh, by honoring the word of the Lord by honoring his vow. <laughs> People used to take vows seriously, you know, and uh, uh, and uh, he's also if he had compromised he would have been setting a bad example for the king of Sodom. Yeah, Joe. Well. Uh, it's interesting that immediately after his uh, his hand is, is dried up, get rid of the Jeroboam immediately asked the prophet to ask the Lord to restore it. So he is acknowledging that he knows who the true God is, 
He's acknowledging that he knows. He doesn't say, come on, you guys, pray to the golden calves to get my hand back. And to me, it's so many people turn to the Lord that they deny exist so many times or that they say he doesn't have authority over them. The minute he has a true need over which he has absolutely no control, he knows to whom he has to turn. There's no try this, try this, try this. It's like, please ask the Lord to fix it back. And then he tries to pay for it. And I think by not accepting the hospitality of the king, the prophet is further saying, you had nothing to do with this. This is all of God. And you know it's all of God, or else you wouldn't have asked. You know, you'd have been looking for the best physicians in your country. You'd have been asking your priest. You'd have been asking your God. Mm-hmm. So it's a it's a recognition and acknowledgement of the knowledge that Romans says we all have. That's right. We know we have a knowledge that there is a God. We just choose or cho- choose to or not to obey. But at the same time, he doesn't ask the prophet to thank God for undoing what he has done. No, that's true. Yeah, so Jim, what Jill's bringing up it, you know, is what Calvin would say, uh, the <coughs> divine um, imperative or the divine imperatory. You know, it's, it's what, what's in the heart of man. You know, they can deny, they can repress the knowledge of God, they can suppress it in unrighteousness. But what happens when their car's about to drop off the cliff? Who do they call out to? They know it. it just springs up instantly. They know it. They know it. Um, even the most staunch atheist in the mo- in a moment of crisis knows. You know. Uh, now they don't have a relationship. It's, you know, with him and uh, and so forth. But but that's a good point, Joe. I mean, it's a really good point. He he, he knows exactly uh, how much worth his golden calves are. Mm-hmm. But the sad thing is that even after experiencing this, he they, he still does not repent. And so you can think about like John 12, where it says, even though Jesus had done so many mighty works in their name, you know, before them, yet they still did not believe in him. And now behind the scenes, we can see uh, the the explanation for that, uh, because the verse continues and it says, because God has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. Um, So it's, but we see this, we see this throughout the, the, the Bible. We also see um, th- this, this uh, offer that Jeroboam is offering, it comes with strings attached. Mm-hmm. And this is the way it always is with the wicked. Um, they'll offer you things in order to uh, get you on their side. Uh, and I, I've been offered bribes, both overtly and, and subtly, uh, from people. If, if I accept a gift from you, it's because I trust you. And, and it's because I... Uh, don't believe I believe you're not trying to manipulate me. Uh, but you know, when the first time it happened, uh, I remember being so struck by it. The first time it happened uh, was when I moved up. When we first moved up here, and Heather remembers this story. It was a man who was uh, who was living in adultery, living with another. He was married. She was married to different people, and they were living together. And he offers me uh, a gift so that I won't speak to it. He he offered me his vacation home. Beautiful home, beautiful place on the beach, and we could go anytime we wanted, free vacation. But it came with strings attached. And and, and I knew I had to make a decision right there. I am not going to play that game. Because once you play that game, once you play that game, uh, you have no... uh, First, you invite the curse of God. You invite the displeasure of God, and you're absolutely worthless as a a preacher, as a pastor, um, to, to people. If you compromise... You're absolutely worthless. If, you, if you're not free to be able to tell people the truth, that's um, that's one of the reasons that churches are supposed to support their pastors monetarily is to keep us free so that we don't have to worry about you know worldly concerns. And this church has always been uh, very uh, very good to, to us to me on that. Okay, uh, all right. We're not going to be able to get through all this today, but uh, but I do want to press on just a little bit. Okay, because Floyd bring, brings up this old prophet uh, in Bethel, verse 11, okay? Now an old prophet lived in Bethel. Here's what we're going to see. We're going to see that... How can I 
say it. False religion, subtleties in false religion, can corrupt the righteous more easily than, uh, than just blatant wickedness. So this man can't be bought by riches. He can't be bought by power. Uh, he's not giving in to Jeroboam at all. But here's, what, here's the sad part of the story. An old prophet lived in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told to their father the words that he had spoken to the king. So, the, so now the, the man knows the words that he had spoken to the king. What words did he speak? He said, he said uh, I can't eat. I can't drink. I have to go back a different way. I have to go back. I can't stay in this, in this northern kingdom. And their father said to him, which way did he go? And his son showed him the way that the man of God who came from Judah had gone. And he said, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he mounted it. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. So he wants to get in good with this young prophet. People are attracted to power. They like to, they like to get in good with, uh, you know, with that which they're not a lot of times. And he said, I may not return with you or go in with you. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. So same thing he said to Jeroboam, right? He's good so far. And he said to him, I also am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of Yahweh, by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you into your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Okay, thoughts before we get to it. The law of non contradiction. Explain that, if you will. Well, truth doesn't contradict itself. That's all parallel. So if God says one thing, he's not going to say something else that contradicts what he just said. Everybody hear that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If God says one thing, he's not going to contradict later what he said. Of course. Yeah, we, we, we would think that'd be self-explanatory, but it's not. Yeah, Ava? I mean, look at our culture. Ava? Um, so here's a modern version of that, okay? 2 Timothy 2. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. <clears throat> and yet today, how many women say, I'm called by God to the ministry. God's calling me. I've had men that I've had this discussion with say, but so sister so-and-so is called by God. She says she is. She says she is. She feels it in her heart. Who are you? Who, who do you think you are, Philip, to say no to that to, to the person that God's calling? You know, uh, God's really calling me to live with my girlfriend. Live with, you know, whatever. Uh, I really believe He's going to bless this. I really feel it in my heart. Uh, God's showing me that I should leave my spouse. God's calling me to it. We, we're called to be together. We love each other. Um, God's telling me that I don't have to go to church. That I don't need to be, uh, you know, I know the scriptures say submit to those who have authority over you for the keeping watch for your souls. Do not forsake the assembly of yourselves together as is a manner of some. But God's really calling me to do this. Who are you? Who do you think you are to say that I have to do this? God's telling me I don't. No, God's not telling you. Anything that contradicts his word. He's not. Um, and this, so this man is lying and he knows he's lying. Um, but he's playing fast and loose with God. He doesn't fear the Lord. He doesn't, he doesn't have uh, reverence for God's word, uh, this, old, this old prophet. And sadly, the uh, young man does not understand uh, the, the, the law of non-contradiction, as our brother says. 
and he but these are here for our edification aren't they these these things are written for our instruction yes I want because well he's a uh, he's in sin is the long and short of it now the interesting thing is that God has mercy on this man as we'll see later in, 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 the, in the chapter we may have to end in just a minute because we're about out of time but what's one of the most dramatically gracious things in this chapter is that the old prophet seemingly repents at the end. Um, even after falling into this heinous sin of false prophecy. And, and amazingly, uh, as, we see, as we see in a few minutes, the lion doesn't eat him. His life is spared. So we see the sovereignty of God to show mercy even to... Uh, Someone who is in great wickedness, uh, but the old prophet is is acting as a Satan type character. You know, there's the personal uh, Satan, and then there's the, the you know the devil, and then there's the those who follow in his ways, those who uh, who are called the sons of the devil, like Jesus uh, calls them in John eight forty four. I saw I saw a church sign that said something about all God's children and. And, I, and always, anytime I hear people talk about all God's children, I think about, yeah, you know, all God's children, those who are adopted uh, through faith in Jesus Christ and are, and, are, and are united to Him. But Jesus says to those who, uh, of those who reject Him, you are of your father the devil. So anyway, uh, so but but what does Satan do in Genesis three? Um, what's his very first thing that he says? Uh, to Eve after Eve has received a clear command from God. Does anybody know? No? He doesn't say that. He's too subtle for that. Did God really say? God really said. Right. Yeah, did God really say? Did God really say? That's the first thing that he says. See, if Satan came to, if Satan did what Jeroboam did and, uh, you know, and just, just brazenly uh, uh, contradicted, uh, you know, it, it might be too subtle, but or it might be too obvious, but uh, he's subtle. And so this this prophet, uh, you know, this prophet has a plausible argument. An angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord. You know, I'm a prophet too. You know, Richard Baxter in the uh, Reformed Pastor. Jason, you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> Richard Baxter in the Reformed Pastor, uh, the book, the Reformed Pastor. He said that ministers who speak pleasantries to the people who will not. Uh, rebuke their sin, who will not correct their sin, who will not uh, stand firm on the word of God. He said, you got, he wrote to his presbytery, which was falling into to, to lukewarmness. And he said, he said, I'm trying to be a faithful, in, a, in essence, I'm trying to be a faithful man of God, stand on the word of God, command what God commands, uh, encourage what God encourages, correct what God corrects, and you guys aren't, basically. He didn't say it just like that, but he said, he said, you're, he said, you're telling the people what they want to hear, and anytime I correct them by the word of God, you know what they do? They point to you, and they say, they say, who do you think you are, Richard Baxter? Uh, the other pastors don't tell us these things, and they're just as qualified as you are, just as dignified as you are. And so Baxter said, you're cut. Basically, you're cutting the legs out from under me. I'm trying to tell the people the truth. Boy. I'm just saying that technically that's not true. The minute they take the word away from the Bible, they're kicked out. I mean, they're, they're not qualified. No, you're right. But in the eyes of the people, uh, in the eyes of the people, so this old prophet, you know, he has no, in the eyes of God, like what you're saying, he has absolutely no right to to, to say the things he's saying. Um, but but he deceives the young the young prophet. He deceives him. <clears throat> And uh, we're supposed to honor our elders. So, so the young man, well, maybe God, you know, the young man thinks maybe, well, maybe, you know, since I was faithful, God, God wants to help me out by feeding me because I'm, I'm hungry. You know, it's a long journey. You can still honor your elders. They may not appreciate it. Yes. But you can still do it. Well, that, that's, that's exactly right. The best way to honor somebody is to tell them the truth. Or at least to never compromise the truth. You know, speak the truth in love, always be respectful. But it's it's actually hurting somebody and dishonoring somebody to agree with that which is false, no matter whether they're older than you or not. 
Okay, so, uh, okay. <clears throat> I hate to stop here. Uh, we'll come back to this next week, but, but what you'll see is that uh, the... Uh, I'll, read, I'll read a couple more verses. As they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah. Thus says the Lord. Now this, isn't this interesting? God, God speaks through this old prophet. Thus says the Lord. Because you disobeyed the word of the Lord. And have not kept the commandment of the Lord that the Lord your God commanded you. But have come back and eaten bread and drunk water. In the place of which he said eat no bread and drink no water. Your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. So the word of the Lord is, is spoken through this old prophet. But that was a weird experience for the old prophet. <laughs> After he'd eaten bread and drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. So now he feels bad. And he's just told him he's not coming back. He's not going back to the tomb of his fathers. He's not going back to Judah. But he saddles the donkey for the prophet whom he brought back. And as he went away, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his body was thrown in the road, and the donkey stood beside it, and the lion stood beside the body. And behold, men passed by and saw the body thrown in the road, and the lion standing by the body. And, it came, and, it, and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet lived. Now there's a lot more to this uh, text. We're going to have to uh, wrap it up for now. But, um, but there's a lot more. There's, there's God's sovereignty. There's, there's God, uh, you know... Uh, Keeping the lion from devouring the donkey. Um, there's uh, the the aftermath of what happens with the, with the uh, the man and his sons, the old prophet and his sons. Um, there's an epilogue that happens 290 years later. So there's a lot more that we have to look at. But uh, final questions and thoughts so far. Isn't it amazing how the Old Testament is so relevant for today uh, still? Yeah, Walt. I just find it interesting uh, that just a few whatever, maybe it was a few hours before that or a few minutes before, however long it took, he was lying with his mouth previously and then within a period of time, a fairly short period of time, God was speaking through his mouth. That's just bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, this, this had, um, this theme of God working through those who are not born again, even, uh, it is tremendous in church history. Um, it, it, it has to do with... So there's a question in the early church that... Uh, just a minute, I see y'all. There's a question in the early church about um, what happens if your pastor is an unbeliever and he's baptized you or he's been serving you communion? Um, does that invalidate the sacrament? And the answer was no. The, the, the efficacy of the sacraments, the efficacy of the Word of God is not based on the person that's preaching it. It's based on the work of the Spirit. Um, so that, you know, pretty interesting. So the, so the prophecy through this man does not stand or fall based on whether he's born again. Um, God is sovereign to do what he wants. Uh, so it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, of course, there are warnings against an unconverted ministry, too. Abel, what were you going to say, sir?
what he was doing. That's pretty imaginative of you. Of course, you know, when you say that, it does make me, when it says an angel spoke to me, what does Paul say in Galatians 3? If we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, preach any other gospel other than that which, been, which has been preached, let them be accursed, yeah, anathema. There's a lot of other gospels going on today. And the temptation is to say, well, you know, just agree to disagree. And one person believes that, you know, you have to repent and believe in Christ alone for salvation. Another person says, yeah, there's many ways to go. Well, who are we to judge? Well, the Bible says that you are to judge those of the household faith, 1 Corinthians 5. Um, and it says so clearly, if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel. It doesn't say, you know, <coughs> everything will be okay or let's all get along. It says let them be accursed. Um, so I'm tempted to go into a Galatians 1 sermon, but I better not. Any final questions or thoughts or anything? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this time that we've had together. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for your word. Lord, you gave, you gave uh, just a, a small word to this young prophet. And we see in your text, we see in the Bible that he should have, that should have been sufficient for him uh, to keep him from deception. And Lord, we thank you that we have this entire book, uh, 66 books, to reveal to us your will and your word and your ways. Uh, to keep us from being deceived, no matter what others say. Um, and so we are thankful, Father. We are thankful. Uh, we pray that you would uh, always bind our hearts to your word, uh, to you. Uh, that we would uh, not go the way of this young prophet and uh, meet not only death by a lion, but, uh, but something far worse. We pray for those that are deceived, uh, that believe they're hearing from you uh, in a way that contradicts your word. Uh, Lord, would you be pleased uh, in the lives of many uh, to uh, point them to scriptures like this and many, many others and uh, show them who they are in the text. And we pray for your blessing as we, as we go home. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.